morning, good afternoon, welcome to all of you here on this call today, in this meeting today. I see we have people joining us just as we speak. So let me allow me to use that time to welcome you today, today's human rights conversation on third world approaches to international law, the TWAIL movement and human rights. My name is Felix Kirchmeier and I'm your moderator for the next hour and a half. Let me just uh, say a word on the Human Rights Conversation series. Uh, they are a series of events hosted here in Geneva by the Geneva Human Rights Platform, aimed at discussing contemporary issues and challenges related to the promotion and protection of human rights, both here in Geneva by the international mechanisms and beyond. The topic of today is a third world approaches to international law, TWAIL. It is a movement encompassing scholars and practitioners of international law and policy who are concerned with issues related to the Global South and its broad conception. Over the last 20 years, the TWAIL network has grown and flourished, encompassing thousands of people on all five continents. While the scholarly agendas associated with TWAIL are diverse, the common themes of TWAIL's interventions are to unpack and deconstruct the colonial legacies of international law. Four excellent speakers who will address the questions around TWAIL and human rights universality accompany me in our virtual panel today. So to briefly introduce them, we have uh, Obiora Okafor, UN independent expert on international solidarity. Fabia Fernandez Carvalho Verposo, member of the editorial collective of the TWAIL Review. Tamil Ventan Avavina Yagan, School of Law of University of Nottingham and uh, Shayami Puvi Manasinghe, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. I um, excuse for the pronunciation of the names. Uh, I hope you were able to self-identify. With their help, um, I wish to take a close look at legitimate criticism on human rights narratives and how to respond to theoretical arguments such as cultural relativism or exceptionalism on universal human rights, which nowadays take a stronghold on multilateral negotiations, making it increasingly harder to achieve or even to maintain consensus. This discussion is part of an ongoing research project here at the Geneva Academy aimed at taking stock of and contributing to a better understanding of the various criticisms and tensions around the principle of universality of human rights, contrasting or reconciling different narratives. I also at the outside, uh, outset would like to, to thank all of you for your interest. We had a very large number of people inscribing for this uh, um, meeting today. The event is also being um, recorded and will be webcast for those who in the end were not able to join us at this very time. We know that the global events and the tragic <coughs> military actions by Russia and Ukraine are also taking the attention of many. Nevertheless, uh, I'm sure that we should not stop talking, uh, continuing other debates, uh, talking about important other issues, even at, at those times. So uh, let me go with this right away into the introduction of our panelists to give them the floor because they have much more to say on the topic than me. And first of all, I would like to turn to Fabia Fernandez Carvalho Veposo. So uh, additionally to what I mentioned, being a member of the editorial collective of the TWAIL Review, she's a postdoctoral fellow with the Laureate Program in International Law at the University of Melbourne. Well, as a reaction actually to the announcement of this event, um, Fabia, uh, we had some people questioning our use of the term of third world. Preparing also for the discussion, I read an interesting article from 1979 stating that in the 50s, the phrase tiers monde, third world, was more used in the sense of a third force, actually, rather than third world, indicating non-alignment rather than underdevelopment. So if you can, uh, for all of us, uh, say some words on what is the Tway movement, what is its history and claims, and how can TWAIL help to strengthen universal and internationalist uh, development of international law, in particular, of course, in the field of human rights law? So with this, Fabia, I would like to turn over to you. And uh, just to mention also, I forgot to mention that before we have those four presentations, uh, they will be rather short. So we have ample possibility for discussion then with all of you. So we're looking forward to an interactive discussion after all the four speakers will have uh, given their presentations. 
So with this, Fabia, over to you, please. Many thanks, uh, Felix, and also to, to the Geneva Human Rights Platform to be here today. Greetings to my fellow panelists, Tamil, Obi, and, and Shayami. It's great to see you even virtually. I mean, currently in Brazil, so good opportunity to see interesting, to engage with interesting people. Um, so I wanted to, um, Felix, you have already started to comment on, on the main issues of, of TWAIL, but I, I wanted to expand on your um, intro, introductory comments using um, Tony Angi's um, foreword to the first issue of the TWAIL uh, review. In, in his piece, he puts, I think, pretty clearly uh, what are the fundamental um, TWAIL concerns and then I will also move to mention quickly um, Jamie Gatti's uh, recent lecture about the promise of international law, which I think it's a perfect piece that um, organized uh, Twales ideas and, and third world sensibilities in a very clear um, way. So following Tony's um, questions, um, Twale, uh, as important concerns for the Twale movement, um, how, how does, we can think of imperialism reproducing itself in the contemporary world. So it's really a changing the focus of international law as a neutral, a political or detached um, body of, of rules and blueprints for the world, but instead to actually um, put imperialism and the issues of imperialism as the center of our theoretical, analytical um, questions around uh, international law. So how should we understand imperialism? Can international law be used to, foster, to further the interests of third world peoples? So is it just a tool of oppression or can we actually engage with the international law in um, a strategic, interesting way as a, as a form of, of resistance? And for sure, how we can transcend Eurocentrism um, in international law, opening spaces for different kinds of thinking in international law. So um, I think, and, and this is also following Tony's uh, claims, uh, Tueyo scholars work hard to demonstrate how international law works. So this commitment to, um, this complicity, sorry, to the colonial endeavor, international law is in a way part of, a pr of the problem in terms of schemes of exploitation, domination, plundering, and all sorts of, um, uh, ways of um, subjugating uh, other peoples. So international law is, is uh, it's a history. It's not exactly a bright history, but instead its complicity to this project of exploitation is pretty clearly explained by Tueyo scholars. It has been explored in detail by um, Tueyo scholars. So in this setting, it's we can always discuss, of course, periodizations, but in the Twail movement, it is common to organize a bit um, the, the movement in different generations, if we can say. So we have a, a, the decolonization moment and the first reaction of uh, scholars from the global south, as commonly put as Twail, the first um, generation of Twail. And then at the end of the 90s, uh, we have Obi here, one of the founders of this uh, other moment in, in the Tueyo movement, a, a, another articulation of third world sensibilities. And now I would say um, the Tueyo uh, scholarship has broadened and it is, uh, as Felix has already mentioned, it encompasses peoples from all five continents, not just in the, in the global south. So this is not just a, geographic, a geographically idea of the third world, but um, all people also in the global north uh, have issues that are related to um, third world um, sensibilities in a way that this is a scholarship that really enables a different understanding of international law as a discipline, as a field of practice, as a way of theorizing about um, the world. Um, so um, I would, I really, really find uh, James Gatti's um, lecture productive to understand um, Tueyo today. And I love the way he um, has put it as a news, an epistemic, the third world as an epistemic side of knowledge production. 
So Tueyo has also to do with the way we ask questions in international law, with the sites of knowledge production that are um, located in the familiar places that we are used to see international law, Washington, Gen Washington Geneva, New York. And instead, the Tueyo movement calls for a different um, approach to see where international law has been produced in different projects, different, uh, sorry, in different locations. So this idea of the third world as an epistemic side of knowledge production, it says a lot about how we can engage with international law from a, a sensibility that is connected to the issues of the third world, inequality, poverty, violence, and exploitation, issues that have not ended with colonialism actually, but that are reproduced until today. So this is another important um, aspect of this way with scholarship, history matters incredibly. It's important and actually fundamental to reread the history of international law as a way to see this complicity with our past of uh, colonialism and imperialism, but also to think about our future as um, peoples in, in this planet um, that we maybe cannot reproduce these schemes of exploitation and and violence. So these are not issues that are stuck in the past, but also speak very much to our, to our present in the Tuail um, scholarship. Um, so the invitation here is to have the third world as an anti-subordinating term to follow uh, Gatti's um, lecture, The Promise of International Law. So to disrupt and dismantle these hierarchies on which a equal production about the knowledge of international law is produced and practiced in, in our world. So this, and I'm finishing here as my time is short and I just want to pave the way for my fellow panelists. Um, the thing here is maybe not just a matter of including voices or excluding voices, but resisting these modes of knowledge production that actually silent voices from different locations in international law, not the familiar locations that we are used to hear about uh, our discipline. So I thank you for this invitation and I now leave the floor for my fellow panelists. Thank you, thank you very much, Fabia. And uh, indeed we'll hear from the other panelists and we'll surely hear also back from you in the discussion. Uh, so let me turn with this directly to my second panelist, uh, Tamil Ventan Avarina Yagan, a teaching associate in international human rights law at the School of Law at the University of Nottingham. So uh, Tamil, how, how would you see maybe if we, if we look also, we, we heard about the, the genesis and the development of, of the network, but also I think one of the deconstructions uh, is also human rights law. And so how would you see tensions or maybe also mutual reinforcement between the Twail approach and the universal, universalist approach to human rights. And obviously also if you could address the importance of uh, economic, social and cultural rights in the Twail movement to overcome colonial injustices as this, I think in line with universality of human rights, seeing uh, all human rights as interconnected and indivisible would enlighten us a lot. So over to you, Tamil, please. Um, well, first of all, you know, joining um, the fabulous Fabio, uh, I, I'd like to, uh, you know, uh, also echo my sincere thanks to um, the Geneva platform, but in particular, Emily uh, was, you know, triggered everything, um, but then also to you, Felix, um, and Yasmin there in the background. Um, and it's also my, you know, profound honor um, to share this panel with uh, great academics, such as uh, Fabia and uh, Obi, um, I'm I'm constantly trying to keep track and and, and follow your footsteps. Uh, certainly. Um, so when I started my academic career, um, Felix, I I think um, uh, the area that I was focused on was human rights and still is human rights. And I always thought at the beginning of this academic career that um, international human rights law is going to be the panacea uh, to all the ills in the world. Uh, but soon I was uh, coming to the point to realize I was totally mistaken. Um, and uh, I was quite disillusioned. Um, and uh, I will tell you why. Um, Rémi Bachon mentions that the relationship between the universality and particularity that is Twyla's argue that the current universal and official human rights corpus is based essentially 
in European philosophy, although the concept of human rights is not unique to European societies. We as Twilers detect a universalizing and imaginary based on the premise that they are neutral, objective and apolitical. And um, the example is the emphasis on civil and political rights. Um, so I want to you know, go more into the details of tensions uh, now, um, before then moving on to the mutual reinforcement and what the role is then of economic and social rights. Um, we should be fully aware that historical root causes, uh, and that is where Fabia said, history matters. Um, his, the historical root causes of the current dismal state of socioeconomic rights are not addressed in the third world. Uh, and uh, thus, it is not easy and, and uh, simple to approach human rights from a formal, textual, uh, and institutional angle. Uh, that's simple and clear. Uh, we need also to recognize that international human rights law is manipulated and uh, uh, um, to, a, to a great extent contaminated to promote and legitimize uh, neoliberal aspirations. Uh, and it unveils a discrepancy between uh, the languages that international adopts in different subject streams uh, when some, uh, supporting the promotion of human rights and disregarding the practice of international trade and economic law, which constantly violates human rights law. And to this end, my own research was dealing with international human rights engagement of the United Nations with uh, the Global South, in particular with the example of Sri Lanka, where human rights was often just used as a neoliberal um, language, a conducive environment for neoliberal trade. We need to, at the same time, understand the internationalization of human rights violations uh, to an extent how certain activities have detrimental effects in other parts of the world, in particular, the third world. Uh, and we need to find ways to equip scholars from the third world uh, to find more uh, justifications for extraterritorial obligations from richer states. We also have to attempt the point to demystify um, that human rights are conceived in the West. Uh, and there are diverse approaches to international human rights law. Uh, to this end, I'm hoping to uh, publish a book as an editor with third world scholars from all over the world um, and uh, contribute to the literature of international human rights. So the third world has a say on the making of international human rights law. And this is where we have to go with the demystification uh, as international human rights law stands. Formal, or furthermore, um, we need to deconstruct the ideology um, that uh, uh, um, Mac Pro Professor Makamu Tua has stipulated, namely the savages victim savior metaphor, um, that is really underpinning um, the very uh, nature of international human rights law. Uh, as the global south is to a certain extent uh, uh, depicted as the negation of the liberal form of international human rights law. And we need to encounter uh, in counter narrative as a form of resistance with our approaches to international human rights from the third world that uh, the essential structure of the civilizing mission, mission of the North uh, has to be come to an end. I'm fully aware of time. I might be a third world scholar, but I'm at the same time also a citizen of Germany. Uh, so I want to stick to my time. Um, how can we reinforce now an international human rights law from the third world approaches to answer this question? Professor Makao Mutua, as I said earlier, was very optimistic um, when he noticed that human rights corpus is slowly moving and evolving from, a, from this paradigmatic Western view uh, and stops to be seen as a gift from the West to the rest of the world. Uh, it's about the construction of a truly universal project. Therefore, the emphasis on civil and political rights, especially since the mid 1990s, has been paid to the economic uh, and uh, economic powerlessness and the effect of globalization on the people. And a truly legitimate human rights movement cannot be cabined by powerful states and elites, be them from the global north or from the global south. It must be material for the battle of the powerless 
against the powerful. And if we really want to make international truly international, then we have to build international law from the below, like uh, Professor Balakrishna Rajagopal has famously uh, stipulated. This means then we need to get rid and purge international human rights law from its Eurocentric, racist, and free market bias, uh, as Professor Makao Mutua says. We have, as TWIL1 and TWIL scholarship has already uh, stipulated and promoted and highlighted, focused from a, a great idea, namely uh, starting with uh, the right to development, moving then on to the voice uh, and, and giving voice to the marginalized people of the third world states. International human rights law, and with that, I would like to conclude giving then the floor to the um, cherished uh, and esteemed colleagues there. International human rights law needs to promote uh, a universal culture of human rights, uh, which actually includes the Global South input. And without the Global South input, international human rights law can never be international. And with that, I would like to conclude. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tamil, for highlighting those tensions. Also, again, of course, the geographic uh, parts of the third world um, <clears throat> approach in international law. And I think we'll definitely come back to that uh, deconstructing and reconstructing from below in, in human rights uh, law terms. So I think that uh, would be very interesting to, to discuss a little bit more in the coming discussion. You yourself mentioned right to development. So it's my pleasure now to turn to the third speaker, to Shiami Huvi Manasinghe, human rights officer at the right to development section at the office of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. So when we turn to those debates and issues in the Human Rights uh, Council, the area of the right to development is surely one that invokes a decolonial approach to human rights. Can you comment on the resonance and relevance of the right to development and how the TWAIL movement can contribute and also maybe give us an update of the latest developments in the Human Rights Council debates on right to development. We know that there is that uh, <clears throat> continuing discussion on standard setting. So maybe you can also update us a little bit on this. So with this, uh, over to you, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you, Felix. Thanks to the organizers and to my fellow panelists and all the participants. Um, in the context of what Fabia and Tamil have already discussed. I think the right to development fits very well uh, within that, that context. So talking about resonation, how does it resonate with the academic discussions of, of the saviors and the savages of um, Makao Mutua or development from below of uh, Rajakrishnan, um, Balak, Balakrishnan Rajagopal? Um, as you know, and, and I'm not sure how much knowledge there is of the right to development in this particular audience. I'm sure some are very well cognizant of it, whereas others to others, it may be new or, uh, so I will just say a little bit about the history and, and its main contents to start off with, to see how it resonates. So it comes directly out of the, the quest for a new international economic order, out of the quest for a charter for the rights and duties of states, and uh, trying to bring some synergy between the world of development and the world of human rights. As you know, the United Nations is built on the three pillars of peace and security, very important, it, uh, probably our greatest preoccupation right now, peace and security, development and human rights. And this right to development brought all of these together. The early writings of African scholars, it is really, I think, rooted in Africa. So we have the writings of uh, Keba Mbaye of Senegal, of um, George Abisab of Egypt, of Mohammed Bejawi of Algeria. So clearly rooted in the writings of the developing world, but then brought to the United Nations over a long, historical process where developing countries following, well, the newly independent countries following decolonization uh, 
soon began to struggle. For example, in 1966, we had Dudu Thiam of Sen Senegal, the foreign minister saying um, that we need to fight for fairness in the international system, the international economic system, particularly fairness, justice. So it really did come out of that search for human rights, but not human rights, pure and simple, not only civil and political rights, also economic, social, cultural rights, but all bound together in this sort of holistic and multidimensional framework, which looked at both national and international dimensions. Because whereas traditionally human rights do look at primarily at the obligations of the state, towards its own people, which is of course of prime importance. Uh, the right to development also looks at those gaping gaps and failures in the international economic system, be it from going from the history of decolonization to the history of globalization or what some call hyper-globalization now, nowadays. So, Still, we can see that the, the right to development debate is very much alive. The dialogue is very much uh, vibrant, although there have been, you know, different points in its history, a high point when we adopted the declaration in 1986, and then maybe not so high points. And now again, there is a momentum because there is the making of a treaty on the right to development. There is already a draft binding convention, which is now being negotiated in the working group on the right to development. So resonance, I see, and relevance. When you talk of relevance, if we look at what happened in COVID-19, now we fast forward to COVID-19, uh, more than ever before, we see these glaring gaps, right? Gaps in, as Obi would agree, I'm sure, gaps in international solidarity, international cooperation, multilateralism, because we just have to look at one example, the gap in vaccines, the gap in access to vaccines, which is, of course, so complex that we cannot, um, you know, boil it down to one particular factor, but we know that one of the one big issue, which has been, again, a North-South debate, is that of the TRIPS waiver, which has been um, ongoing in the WTO and is still un ongoing for a waiver, given the emergency circumstances, the plea from India, South Africa, uh, Kenya, Eswatini, and about 100 other developing countries. So these de debates, these dialogues keep going on, and you can see them in every sphere. If you look at climate and environment, the, the plea for climate justice. If you look at debt, the plea for debt justice. So practically all around the global economic system, there are still some unfulfilled um, quests uh, for justice, for human rights. And I think this is where the 12 uh, writings, research, publications probably come closest to the, the, the right to development debate. Um, who are the rights holders of the right to development? Individuals and peoples, individuals and people. So whole populations, because this was decolonization and we had to think of the entire populations of states as well as groups, women, uh, indigenous peoples, um, persons with disabilities, all the groups that we talk of in the vulnerable and marginalized minorities, racial minorities, ethnic and religious minorities at the national level. So it really has this national and international dimension which is brought together, who are the duty, duty bearers. Again, the high level task force on the right to development laid down that there were three levels of duty bearers in the right to development. First, of course, the usual one that we know and we agree on, uh, which is the rights, uh, the, the duties of states, the primary duties of states towards their own people. But then a second layer of extraterritorial obligations. So when one state or a group of states or a region uh, adopts uh, or actually just one state adopts, for example, agricultural subsidies or, or a a policy which then affects people in other states, there's extraterritorial obligations. And thirdly, globally, organizations and states act 
acting through regional and global partnerships, which could also do a lot of good or a lot of damage through their policies. So the right to development is very much about policies, particularly economic policies. Felix, how am I doing for time? Um, have I exhausted my time? <clears throat> uh, nearly, yes, but I'm uh, happy to give you still two minutes to wrap up. Okay, so on the last point of how can Twail uh, contribute, I think in many ways, there are many possibilities and I'd be happy to talk even after today if anybody would like to get in touch. Uh, <clears throat> because we have several mechanisms on the right to development. The strong uh, commitment to the right to development on the part particularly of developing countries or third world countries, if you may, is seen in the fact that we have several mandates. So we have the mandate of the, uh, the Secretary General and the High Commissioner have a mandate to mainstream the right to development. And that was part and parcel of when the office was set up promoting and protecting all human rights is its mandate, but there is a specific mandate to mainstream the right to development. Uh, then the special rapporteur, we have a special rapporteur on the right to development. We have more recently an expert body, an expert mechanism of five regional experts, which is a bit similar to the high level task force of the, of, uh, of the past where you have five experts from the five continents. Um, and we have a RTD biennial panel, um, and, and of course the intergovernmental working group where the treaty is being negotiated. So there is space, there is room, there is opportunities for 12 scholars, researchers, students, supporters to get involved with the right to development. If you see uh, you know, scope for your involvement uh, in many ways, even on a Facebook platform, for instance, we do have a Facebook page on right to development to take on this debate, to carry on the dialogue and bring in um, activists, experts, everyone. Then we have a training program. We have other new uh, mandates also in the office, which are rather similar to the right to development, but uh, not the same, of course. Like I do reports on international cooperation. As you know, right to development is premised on international cooperation and the duty to cooperate, which is today, you know, seen um, uh, rather negatively because we, we don't see enough cooperation. But there are also new forms of cooperation, like South-South cooperation, regional cooperation, which are really, which are kind of filling in some gaps of uh, some failures in traditional uh, cooperation. Um, so there are many ways to, you, um, uh, to participate, to engage with the different mechanisms, as well as us as the office. We have a specific section on the right to development, and we have other mandates as well, such as a new mandate from China, which is called the contribution of development to human rights, another mandate called mutually beneficial cooperation. And these are all they all have some links to the right to development. And of course, international solidarity mandate, international order mandate, the mandate on, uh, on debt and, and several other mandates and, and environment and climate change as well. Thank you. Thank you, Shamia. Thank you very much for running us through that update on right to development, its origins, the, the early writing and actually where we are today. Uh, I myself recall being much more involved in those intergovernmental debates than I'm now, but I'm wondering also when we speak about universality, whether what's the situation today in the working group on right to development, because Tamil also brought up before the geographical um, positioning of TWAIL, it's both as geographic and it's topical, but I think also geographic, if we look at the working group, at least in the times I engaged more with it, there was quite a geographic imbalance and which states give more importance to those discussions than others. So, so I would like to see also where we're getting in this. And also, I think it's very interesting, the breadth of the, um, the work that you mentioned with those many different mandates, where I also would like to see maybe a discussion uh, on where the substantive links in those lie. And I'm happy we have a mandate holders with, um, holder with us as the next speaker, who is actually also holding a mandate that has links to right to development and also where political use or misuse of the topic might lie. And in particular, I think of the recent Chinese initiatives you mentioned. So I think there is uh, quite a bit to discuss between the geographical and the topical uh, third world, third force uh, <clears throat> approaches. So looking forward to continuing 
uh, this discussion. And again, I think, as you mentioned, the universality of right to development in addressing development, human rights, and uh, security, obviously, is, is an excellent link to this debate. With this, let me <clears throat> turn to the fourth panelists of today. Um, and also, of course, I see that there is already a, a little discussion starting up in the chat. So please, everyone, do use the chat to share information beyond what is uh, being done uh, orally here. Later on, you'll have the opportunity to take the floor, but you also already can post questions in the chat that uh, is visible to all of us, uh, including the speakers, obviously, so we can get to those then in the discussion. So now let me turn to Obioha Okafor. You are an independent expert on international solidarity and also Edward B. Burling, Chair in International Law and Institutions at the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. Obi, in your special procedure mandate on human rights and international solidarity, you focused lately on climate change, on populism, on economic insecurity. In light of earlier interventions, where do you see the contribution to the TWAIL debate, uh, of the TWAIL debate actually in helping to understand human rights violations, human rights issues in those areas, and obviously all other issues that you'd like to address, just taking also on from the discussion we had on right to development and the uh, links of your mandate with this topic. Obiora, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Felix, and uh, thanks for uh, to you and your colleagues for organizing this, thanks to uh, the Geneva Academy and all these great uh, 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 to exchange views uh, with uh, great practitioners like Shami and scholars like Fabian Thamil and others uh, in the audience uh, today, so to speak. Um, there's not much time <laughs> to say so much. I have a million thoughts, but I, I like to keep to some discipline uh, has already been established, so I will just address your top, you know, uh, um, for now at least, uh, the specific question that you have posed, and I'll, I'll, I'll just hit on the three examples that you you, um, you mentioned, uh, climate change, populism, and economic insecurity, that is my report on the connections of all those to human rights and international solidarity which is my mandate. As, as Fabia said, uh, at the beginning, TWIL takes global history seriously and emphasis here on global and history, not just history, global history, everyone's history. Um, and not just the history of one part of the world that tends to loom large. And that is one of the TWIL analytical conceptual technique, which is to foreground what tends to be backgrounded and to background a little bit more what tends to be over foregrounded. And then to realize uh, what do we see in this new picture? What do we see differently as, as a result? You know? um, and so if we do that, for example, and these are just examples because I only have five to seven minutes. Uh, let me begin with climate change and international solidarity. We, you then see, the notion of historical responsibility, you know, uh, looming large. And I'm conscious that uh, Usha Natarajan is in the audience, at least was a little bit ago, who has done uh, some of the most work on this particular topic. So Usha, don't kill me if I don't get it wrong. Uh, you're more of an expert. Uh, you know, people like my own former student, Sarah Riley Case, uh, people like Julia Dam, of course, my teacher, Carrie Mickelson, uh, have done you know, they are the experts on climate change, but I, you know, I double and I look at the specific issue of international solidarity. So you, you find the issue of historical responsibility being central, much more central than others would allow to the issue of climate justice, right? Um, some would emphasize current emissions, for example, over historical emissions, right? So that is a contribution of, of TWIL to, to underlining the, the impact and effect and the need to account better for, respo uh, for historical responsibility in the way in which you imagine current responsibility sharing. Um, uh, and, and so twill kind of, uh, a twill approach to climate change and solidarity rejects a kind of conceptual and even practical economy of appearances 
where we look only at what we see before our eyes today. We, we look at what we don't see before our eyes that led to today. That, that is just a way to, to understand uh, that approach. And, and, and so staying with climate change for a moment, uh, we then look at what that historical ambition uh, uh, accounting did to human rights over time. So we, you don't look at just a snapshot of today, you look at over time. It's a continuum, a, a, a historical continuum, and not, not, there's no rupture of the yesterday from today. Um, and so the report highlights three things, the, the lack of real accountability uh, in the climate regime, right? And which is not accidental, which is produced. So for example, we'll go from Kyoto that had beginnings of real accountability to, and we know that the EU supported real accountability in, in Kyoto, but the US actually blocks it. And then we actually then dump it down to 2015 pa Paris uh, Agreement. Um, and the tendency, and this is a tendency because the story is a bit complex, of course, of richer states to not show real international, so this is the second point, real international solidarity, refunding uh, 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 sort of uh, climate solidarity, providing the funds that are needed for adaptation, especially, and so on, um, uh, uh, more promises than action in, in the funding department, and also uh, a push by rich states to kind of uh, really tone down uh, to, uh, play on the recent COP to phase out or maybe even phase down common but differentiated responsibilities. We see that from Kyoto to, to 2015 Paris Agreement. In terms of populism and international solidarity, the major argument, and I'll just say, <laughs> just this, I'll just develop this major argument, is the report that, that is relevant here is that international solidarity is essential for the fuller uh, realization of all human rights, and that populism of a certain sort, uh, what I term in that report reactionary populism, impedes or even fundamentally attacks what I call desolidarity, fundamental attack, uh, attacks the idea and practice, uh, and even the enjoyment of international solidarity, which necessarily then results in disproportionately negative impact on the enjoyment of many, if not all human rights, uh, uh, including, uh, or perhaps even especially by Global South, say migrants and refugees, for instance, and historically marginalized uh, violated groups in many countries around the world. So I'll just leave it at that because of time, that is a sum of what I developed in the popular, that aspect, there are many aspects of the populism report, but that's the aspect that's relevant today. And then lastly on economic insecurity, uh, uh, human rights and international solidarity, uh, we pointed out uh, that economic insecurity disproportionately, and this is the aspect again of the report that is relevant, disproportionately affects people and individuals in the global south where there is limited access to social safety nets and also uh, limited uh, financial uh, capacity uh, of many of those countries, not all, but many of them to deal with economic insecurity, uh, uh, which itself uh, leads to, uh, uh, logically leads to, necessarily leads to many human rights violations. We saw that, for example, dramatized during the lockdowns, right? So. A lot of countries literally just pretended that COVID was gone because they just couldn't lock down. There's no, you know, uh, there's no money to to provide the kinds of support, for example, in Canada or US that was given to business if you lock them down. So you just have to deal with it in a different way. Um, uh, uh, and then lastly, uh, we the report on economic insecurity, human rights, and uh, international solidarity also talks about the need to take account uh, of this disproportionality in policymaking always, uh, in both in international and domestic policymaking. For example, I, uh, we, offered the, uh, we offered the example of remittances and the cost of remittances. We do know that remittances um, are for many, very many uh, Global South countries, 
third uh, third space, third world, however you want to term them, countries are extremely important in stemming economic insecurity. Uh, people uh, are able to get educated or have some measure of, um, you know, uh, enjoyment of their social economic rights in large part uh, because of um, um, uh, remittances. Uh, there was a point last year when even the Nigerian Central Bank started to give incentives if you send $1, we'll, we'll, we'll give you 1.5 uh, home, just to tell you how important it is when the central bank starts to make policies like this. And therefore the cost of sending them, uh, a reduction in that cost could transform people direct to the pocket, uh, uh, STEM, economic security, influence the right to education, right to healthcare, right to food, basic food uh, uh, in, in, in the global south. And, and so anyway, these are some of the issues that I, that I raised, and these are the ways in which a twill optic informs uh, the, the work that, that I do, the practical uh, uh, work that I do in, in terms of, uh, of the mandate. So I just, I, I try to just distill some illustrations that way. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Obi, for distilling those point of three reports, and even there you're uh, re restricted in length of, of wording and uh, words and so on. So I'm sure there, there is a lot to say, because I think indeed, and just picking the example from your first report, the historic uh, carbon emissions, the historic um, duties, and obviously the, the danger that comes with, uh, as you said, phasing down or out CBDR of the climate change discussion. I think there is also something we might want to look at as the corresponding danger of uh, phasing CBDR into human rights language. So I think there's really a, a question of how to see those, those two bodies of, of law and of, of um, policy also um, in, in their own rights and also to see whether a converse conclusion of a right to pollute uh, brought up by some how, how to defeat basically uh, that uh, that notion and I think your solidarity in terms of adaptation is definitely an important point uh, just addressing addressing that that issue. Um, so many more things to say and to comment I see there's also comments in the in the chat already. I would like to throw the floor open now as I said I hope in this discussion we have a lot of time for interactive debate. And so I'd like to make true on this and open the floor for all of you here having joined us today. Please do raise your electronic hand, switch on your camera, ideally that we can see you as well. And uh, please do take the floor, um, commenting on what you've heard, uh, asking questions to the panelists or, or adding some, some new points. So I'd like to, <clears throat> to open now and I'll just uh, look over into the participant list here to see who is asking for the floor. So I'd very much encourage everybody to, to take the floor. I saw that two of you have also before already put questions in the chat, but uh, I'd very much like to see you also <clears throat> uh, take those. So I have a first request from the for the floor by uh, Ferus uh, Subax. So the floor is yours, please over to you. So, um, Yasmin, could we please make sure to unmute the speaker? Yes, now you're unmuted. I think you okay. can speak. Thank you. Um, I have a question about the debate between universality and cultural relativism, and then in the context of the current Ukrainian war. So normally when we talk about relativism, we automatically think about a global south. And we've seen many statements and messages whereby, um, unfortunately, the global south is too many times referred to as being uncivilized, underdeveloped, and much more horrible statements. So my question is, do you think that the current Ukrainian war and specifically the effects to people from the global south who are affected by this war, does it alter a new movement of human rights? And if so, what are the predictions of that? And can we also maybe establish that the West in, in this specific instance formed its own cultural relativistic views in the sense that it, it still perceives the global South as being uncivilized, as being underdeveloped. And therefore in principle, everyone has 
universal human rights, but when it comes to the practice of it, we see that there are much discrepancies and differences, and therefore that from a European or westernized relativistic view, um, the, the perception is still that the human rights of one part of the population, and I think we all know who I mean, is more important compared to other people. So I just wonder what your view is on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I <clears throat> might add also the, the current reaction of the Western states to uh, the migration flows uh, compared to other my other refugee uh, to, to earlier refugees flows. So sorry, not migration, refugee flows to earlier refugees flows. So that's also maybe something to look at both from a geographic perspective, obviously, but also from, from that uh, well relativism perspective or however we might come to coin it. If I might ask for more, um, contributions from the participants before turning back to the speakers. So at the moment, I don't see further requests for the floor. So just again, please don't be shy and uh, get into the discussion. I see there is a number of links and things that have been exchanged uh, in the chat. So please do come in. Um, well, but with this, I uh, would also, yes, I see uh, Diego, Diego Valadares, please. Hello, I'll try to, to speak. I don't know if there's a lot of background noise. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, yeah, that's good. Uh, okay, so I'm in, I'm in transit right now. Um, so my question would be, um, I, I, I'm a colleague of Shami, and it's great to see uh, this panel with Dobi, Shami, uh, all of you uh, great speakers, and a, a friend, a longtime friend from Tanil. It's been ages we haven't met in person. Um, so, uh, but... Uh, in, in the office, in the, in the same section that Shami, I cover, one of the issues I cover is the, the uh, least developed countries and the UN processes related to the least developed countries. And I always wonder whether in the twelve debate, we, we are also trying to bring more scholars from these, this uh, subset within the bigger set of developing uh, third world countries um, into the forefront, uh, the poorest countries, among the developing ones. Um, and, and, and how do you see that? Do you see these scholars contributing? Are, are we absorbing enough of epistemic knowledge coming from these uh, 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 countries or, or are scholars from these countries only heard when they make it to Western universities uh, in the end? Thank you. Thank you very much, Diego, for <coughs> coming in from the transit from wherever you are. Um, so do we have further requests for the floor right now? Otherwise, uh, let me just quickly check. Otherwise, I think I'd give it right now to the to the panelists, maybe in the same order as you took the floor before, or just uh, whoever uh, would like to, to come in. Um, so I see um, another point. So somebody uh, from Wayan in the <clears throat> in the chat actually. Um, so just encouraging to you, you to of course take the floor also yourself. If, if you can, sometimes uh, depending on the place you're at, you might not be able to take the floor and speak, uh, but uh, so, so if you're also somewhere traveling, for example. So uh, why is it <clears throat> underdeveloped worlds instead of overdeveloped world is the question. So I think, we, um, well, it's also the, the limits of, of development, I think in, in a global sense that is addressed in this, uh, in this comment. So, well, uh, over to, to my panelists then for, for a moment. I don't know who would like to, is there anyone who'd like to, to go first? So you also can just uh, raise, raise your hand. Yes, Obi, please. Yeah, thank you. I was raising my hand in the old way. Yes, uh, yes, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, uh, just uh, a few, a few uh, uh, comments on both, both uh, uh, Fairuz's point and uh, Diego. Diego's point. Uh, thank you, first of all, uh, to both of you for the questions and the engagement. Um, uh, for, in terms of the new movement uh, question, whether because of the current sort of uh, ferment and uh, solidarity of a sort uh, of a kind with uh, Ukraine, we um, there's a new movement or perhaps a change. Uh, well, it could spur a new movement. I, I don't have uh, uh, sort of uh, a looking glass <laughs> into the future. However, what I have uh, with me is, 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 is a knowledge of the history 
of international human rights and international politics. Um, and that doesn't, that makes me uh, rather reluctant to rush to a quick conclusion in that direction, uh, because the history of human rights solidarity has been undulating rather a, a steady upward uh, uh, graph. And as you said, power refracts our knowledge uh, 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 and also interest refracts. I think that perhaps Ukraine is better explained by power and interest. Um, that has, for example, I combine international refugee and migration studies with national human rights. That has been true in both the refugee migration flows throughout uh, this post 45 history um, and in national human rights law. I think that the ready acceptance of Ukrainian refugees might have something to do with being commonly European or something, but I think it's more about interest and power relations um, uh, than anything else. Um, uh, you might compare that to the Soviet era, uh, Soviet sort of Western conflict. Soviet refugees were always uh, welcome uh, if they defected, not, not necessarily everyone else, right? So, um, and, and yeah, so the, 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 the contrast between that, you know, is quite sharp and it leaves a lot of people wondering whether there are no other invasions. For example, uh, the, the British prime minister stands up in the House of Commons every day and says, we don't like occupations, but he occupies Chagos Islands at the very moment. The incoherence is stark, but yet we don't see it, right? That's what we're talking about. Back, uh, front, foreground in the background. So, so these are these things are always backgrounded, as if there are no other occupations happening before our very eyes. There are no other uh, forceful invasions. I'm not even talking about the ones that happened ten years ago. I'm talking as we speak, uh, happening. So, um, even as much as I, of course, have issued a statement condemning what is naked aggression, but the idea is that all naked aggressions, all occupations, should be condemned and all migrants and refugees should be treated with as much compassion and acceptance. And if we, the less we do so, the less legitimation that we're able to give to human rights and legitimation is extremely important, much more than enforcement. Um, and then the, the, the second, the, to Diego's point about LDCs, you have a point, uh, scholars from the LDCs of course are, are twillers uh, and so on, uh, but also from the global north as well, right? Uh, uh, and also from the south within the north, if you like, uh, um, as well. Um, uh, but of course, you know, there's also the fact that being uh, positioned in the global south comes with disadvantages. That's why a lot of uh, global south scholars tend to work or go move to. Um, uh, Western universities. Some universities, universities are not all equal. Some universities are more powerful than others, either actually in terms of just resources, um, material resources, or even ideational uh, resources. So uh, you are right, there is a divide, there is a kind of, um, I don't know how to put it there, I don't want to call it a hierarchy, but there is a, there is a sort of uh, need uh, to, to be noticed when you publish in certain journals, even Scholars who publish in French and German complain about this to me. Uh, only their English articles seem to <laughs> seem to make them that they publish all this amazing stuff in German and French, and no, nobody sort of not nobody, but you know what I mean, has less uh, resonance around the world than when they do publish in you know the American Journal in English or something. Or in, thankfully, they tend to be multilingual. Well, anyway, um, let me leave it at that. Yeah. Thank you. If I <clears throat> could invite the other speakers also to comment on the questions. So who'd like to? Yes, uh, Tamil, please. I also go old school like Obi here, um, just raising my hand like this. Uh, so uh, I mean, just to echo what, what Obi said, but um, you know, um, just address the points of Firus and then uh, Diego. Um, thanks for the questions. I'm a very rich question, especially from Firus there. Um, I think the current Ukraine Russia war um, and little disclaimer, by the way, uh, at five o'clock uh, UK time, I'm hosting um, 
an event uh, on uh, Russian imperialism and uh, the, the Ukrainian-Russian war uh, virtually um, with uh, some scholars from University of Nottingham. So if anyone is interested, get in touch with me. Um, but I think the war, uh, Russia, Ukraine, as you rightly said there, Fyrus, I think um, has uh, highlighted two things. First of all, uh, we've seen suddenly the humanization of the refugee, um, moving away from you know, this uh, George R. Gumbin style of the camp and the refugee as being an enemy to the state. Um, and we've suddenly seen humanization of the, of the refugee in this current um, uh, war. Um, and secondly, what, what has been bothering and that perhaps fits into what you were perhaps going for and uh, discussing for Fyrus, is namely um, that in the, in the Western media coverage in particular, um, I've, I've heard and seen something on, um, on the news from US, US American media, I think it was CBS, where it was said, well, this is not a war like the usual wars, uh, meaning the global south, us. Uh, but this is a war against the civilized world. So again, there was this perpetuation, this, this uh, demonstration that we are the non-civilized, we are the savages, um, and we are not you know, uh, having that standard of civilization that is afforded to uh, under international law and in particular international uh, humanitarian law, apparently. Um, so that was kind of, you know, um, highlighting and reinforcing what, uh, what I said earlier with Macau Mutua, um, the savages uh, victims metaphor, um, that uh, the, the global south is, uh, you know, again, and we see this in the Ukraine-Russian war seen as, the, as a savage. Um, and uh, we are, uh, we, we, we have to really encounter, and this comes back to the earlier question that you also asked, uh, Fairos, to the question on universalism and cultural rel relativism uh, in, a, in, in a sense that we need to reproduce and, and devise strategies of a counter uh, narrative to human rights uh, in order to lead um, the human rights from the below. Um, and then coming what, to what Diego said, um, the least developed states as scholars in, you know, in, in, in Western countries now, we, we see on the one hand, a brain drain from the global south to the global north, yes. Um, I do, however, you know, having dealt now um, with uh, colleagues from the global south, not sufficient representation of people from the global south in the global north, in particular, uh, when we look at the, the, the global south scholars in the global north, they come um, from privileged positions um, as third world elitists. So that is another troubling uh, environment, I think, um, because uh, the breadth and the wealth of knowledge of the global south is not sufficiently represented um, in the world. Um, and with that, I I'll leave it. And I see there are like three questions, you know, three hands coming up. I don't know what I triggered here, but uh, leave it there. Indeed, we'll have more questions coming. But before that, I also wanted to give a, a chance uh, to, to uh, the other, to, to, to Fabia and Sayami to react to the first round of questions before we get to the second. And well, also, I, I mean, <clears throat> maybe in a second round, uh, you, Tamil, would also want to address, or Fabia now, I, I think you spoke before of the, the way human rights is contaminated by a neoliberal agenda. <clears throat> and that just relates again. I also wanted to pick up Phil Lynch's comment in the chat and uh, ask, for, <laughs> interpret it as a question of, is there also danger of a third world approach being contaminated by political agenda of powerful uh, southern states speaking uh, geographically? Um, so, so now um, with that, uh, sorry, first to go again to uh, Shiami and Fabia, if you'd like to comment on the first round of questions before I then give the floor to those who already asked for the floor for the next round. So, Tell me, would you like would you like to go or I have just brief go comment. Ahead, Fabia, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. No. No. Just uh, also echoing Tamil and Obi. No. It's it's really unbelievable the persistence of the vocabulary of the uncivilized peoples in this in this war. So there's a lot of work to be done um, by by people who have a sensibility to 
exploitation and domination. So it's it struck me how this um, thing that normally when we teach international law and we have to explain that Article 38, no, no, this is something from the past. This is was a way to deal with these things when in the beginning of the 20th century, but it's actually really, really present and is strong and it really calls uh, our attention on, on how much work has to, has to be done in order to somehow um, really transform the way about we think international law and how we theorize international law from, from different places. So it's, um, I, I just wanted to comment, this is a very Latin American kind of position. I'm speaking now from Brazil, also positioning myself very clearly in terms of my speciality, no? So we have this crazy thing of uh, people who say, okay, this is an aggression by Russia and the others that motivated by this anti-imperialism with the United States just uh, somehow celebrates Russia's um, action. No? So this, I, I was just hearing you, hearing you Obi, and all these relations of power that are different in different places and how we relate a lot to politics um, and the way we assess this global event it's impossible to have just a, a one neutral uh, framework to deal with, with these things. So this is more of a comment than, than answering the, the wonderful questions that we have by the floor. And in terms of the um, issue of epistemic knowledge and the global south, um, this, is, this is a very, another very um, acute um, thing that we have to deal with and um, it has to do also with solidarity about, uh, between uh, third world scholars, you know, who, who we cite, who we are we inviting to our um, events and panels and who we are talking to in current debates. So this is something that, not to mention the issue of language, of having English as the dominant language to, to speak and to publish, this is another issue. But I also believe that um, the more we can, we can talk among each other and, and discuss among each other and just open the floor for these different epistemic communities in a more genuine uh, dialogue in international law. There's a lot of work to be done. This won't be changed overnight, of course, but I wanted to mention the, the need for, for academic and, uh, I mean, solidarity in the exchange of, of ideas and especially maybe citing other studies and other people that are doing super interesting stuff in other parts of the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Fabia. And uh, over to you, Sayami, if you would like to comment in this first round of, round of discussion. Yes, thank you, Felix. So on the first question, indeed, uh, the Ukraine-Russia situation. And I, I mean, I started talking about the resonance of the right to development and saying that, you know, peace and disarmament is also not only peace, but disarmament is part of the right to development declaration. So we see the importance of this. And, and it says uh, countries should cooperate to disarm and then use the saved up resources for development. And I, I would say not just development, but inclusive, because there was also a question in the chat about, so what is development, who is development? And that gets us into a huge, um, uh, we can talk another whole day about that. But just to say again, that in terms of development paradigms, um, there is a quite a substantial difference between the idea of development, not perfect, of course, but somewhat better than the pure GDP aggregates that we see the, in, the, in the economic field. We know that up to date, we are only looking at economic aggregates, whether it's GDP per, per capita income and per capita income, et cetera. Whereas the right to development is talking about economic, social, political, cultural development coming from the global south, from those others who are not part of the, the mainstream in that sense, uh, it does automatically bring that diversity. And also looking at issues within countries, racism. Racism and any kind of you know, uh, discrimination, uh, equality. Now, equality is one of the biggest issues now, right? We know that COVID and climate change and everything, all of these issues 
have really exposed and exacerbated pre-existing inequalities and inequalities both within and among countries, talking of SDG 10, SDG 17, the need for global partnership and international cooperation. So of course, it's been quite outrageous. I've also been following you know, some of the really horrendous comments that have been made uh, in the context of the Russian, you know, those, those savage others, just like Mutal said. And you know, they were meant for war. Those people were meant for war. <laughs> but, uh, and so it is really time to resurrect, I think, some most basic provisions of, of the UN Charter, the, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, UN Charter Article 1, 2, 55, 56, all talking about we the peoples and coming together for international cooperation. Global problems must be solved through global solutions. And I know that there is a lot more principle than practice. And I think that is the, the use of conversations like this and, and movements like the TWAIL to see how these wonderful principles that all countries almost have agreed on can be put into practice because that is the biggest, uh, biggest uh, gap, the gap between principle and practice. And on Diego's question indeed, we would like to see more scholarship coming out of people who know, you know, the realities on the ground. So least developed countries and their particular issues, but also small island developing states, which many of them are going to be submerged in the, in the next uh, decades because of climate change. We need climate justice. Then the landlocked developing countries that are lesser spoken of. Uh, Countries in conflict and countries post-conflict, I think we have to look at all these specificities as well. And ending with the um, Universal Declaration, Article 1, Article 28, which are also the basis of the Declaration on the Right to Development. One which says all human beings are born equal in dignity and rights and are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards each other with solidarity. The human rights, as I said at the beginning, often we look at the, the state obligations towards its people, but now with business, the, the, the huge um, injustices that can be caused and human rights violations, environmental violations caused by, by business and transnational corporations, uh, and, and by us to each other, as we can see before our very eyes now what's happening, is to see this relationship of horizontal relationship among human beings and among countries uh, to treat other people the same as yourself. Uh, and Article 28 about an international order and a social order in which all human rights and fundamental freedoms can be realized. Again, a lot of theory, but I think with this um, scholars and others, we need practitioners coming together, we can try to move from this theory to practice. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yamia. Uh, that would have been already also a concluding comment of moving theory to practice, but we're not at the end, luckily, of our meeting today because we have a number of questions still here waiting. We have a little bit over 15 minutes. I would like to ask the people who asked for the floor to be rather brief and concise and also to allow me then within the time that we have to give the floor once again back to the speakers for reactions to your questions and their closing remarks. And so I have at the moment four requests for the floor. If somebody else wants to speak, please do uh, let us know now uh, so that we can close the list of speakers. And I'll hand over right away to the first one who requested the floor in this round, who is uh, Mervat. Mervat Rishmari, please uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I apologize for my voice because I have a very bad cold. I have been listening with great interest and I have learned a lot. So thank you for all the speakers. Um, I was thinking while you were talking, uh, while acknowledging the problem of the past and present uh, framework of human rights, of international human rights law and regional human rights law as well, while acknowledging that, I think it's important for us also to acknowledge that it's a yardstick, uh, a tool that can be used for decolonization, which is what is, what is exactly uh, we are doing, for example, in places like Palestine, Yemen, Libya, Syria. So it's that exact yardstick 
that was adopted by others with pro problematically is now the yardstick that we are using to reclaim our rights. And I think, uh, I don't know how you think about that. What do you think about that? But uh, I think we need, that's the step forward. That's the kind of step forward of moving to practice. Um, so I'll just leave it by, like that. You're on mute, Felix. Thank you very much. I'll give the floor to the next speaker, to um, the next one requesting the floor, Luisa. And if you wish to switch on the camera, yes, that's nice. So we also see you speaking. Please, Luisa, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Felix. And thank you very much for the, the speakers, the panel. It's been like really, really wonderful. I am a PhD candidate at the FU um, Amsterdam University here in Amsterdam. Um, and my topic is in tax justice. So it's a very timely to kind of hear everyone talking about these things. But just uh, perhaps it's a, a bit of a provocation from my side. Um, but just going back to what uh, Shayami said about, uh, well, horizontal relationship between among countries, um, implementation gap, you know, the gap between theory and practice, but mostly what you said about uh, extraterritorial human rights obligations. So this is all very policy kind of oriented, the right to development and everything. This is very policy, it's policy documents. Um, but then whenever we're talking about it in the legal sphere, we lack the instruments. Um, and I say this from this tax justice kind of perspective. So I think my question to the panelists would be, how well do you view the uh, this framework of extraterritorial obligations? How do you think that, we can, can you already see any signs of the possibility of domestic litigation in that direction. Do you see that it's well framed, you know, that we already have the tools around uh, extraterritorial human rights obligations? Can you see, say, I don't know, somebody from, from a third world country um, actually litigating certain things in, in the courts of a, of a developed country? Um, how do you see that? But thank you very much. Thank you very much, Luisa, for the question. And maybe also, I don't know if, uh... Any of you would like to add to the national courts, maybe also uh, recent developments in the UN treaty bodies where also cases on ETOs are being brought. Um, if I may turn to the next um, one who requested the floor, I see uh, uh, um, Ashish Buidal, uh, please. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for the beautiful session. Uh, when it comes to this session, I'm pretty MSO when it comes to TWIL. So therefore, I have a very pretty basic question to the panelists present here. Uh, as uh, Professor Tamil said, uh, when it came to uh, third world, the use of word third world, uh, Felix talked about how third world is used as a word, as a third force. And uh, we even saw how its connotation are being used in international platform, different journalists, platform and all. So uh, my question to the panelist is, should we discuss the uses of word third world itself or not? Or maybe why is the word third world justified in regards to the duel? Uh, it's a purely academic question first. Second, uh, this might be quite a futuristic question, uh, but let's be hopeful, given an opportunity to the 12 scholars, if any document of the uh, human rights treaty is to be uh, edited or amended or this reconstruction of human rights are to be done, where would it be feasible and uh, the best to start from? That's my question. Thank you so much. Thank you for your question. And also maybe uh, additionally to answering, some might also give uh, some hints in the in the chat, maybe for links. Um, I have uh, two more people requested the floor. First, uh, Usha and then Fatima. So first, Usha Natarajan. Hello. Um, I won't be using my video, but just to say thank you to Fabia, Tamil, Shami and Obi for that wonderful Wonderful. I mean, really, I, I loved what you had to say. It was so thought provoking and also just for everything that all of you do for Global South and international law. Um, so my question is, well, I should say I'm speaking to you from Jordan. And so alongside the armed conflict in Ukraine, we've had in this region, we had ongoing US military action in Somalia, Israeli action in Palestine and Syria, Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Um, so all around me, I see not only the loss of life and land and livelihoods for many decades, but also we're losing some of the earliest of human civilizations and the earliest of legal traditions. So 
uh, Shami and Obi, you know, in your really long-standing and amazing work in the UN human rights system, do you see the potential to incorporate not only the interests of the global south, but to draw norms from southern legal traditions to inform the international sphere and make it more effective, given that we see all around us the failure of Western-dominated international laws in so many fronts on environment, migration, populism, development, all the things that all four of you mentioned. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. And I just have one more person who raised his hand. So I'll have first Fatima and then Dila. And please keep it short. So we have already, we'd have hours of responses to those questions that we received. But I'll have to be able to give two minutes to each of the speakers afterwards. So Fatima, please. Okay. Hello, uh, my name is Fatima. This is a purely um, academic question. So I am an international law student at SOAS, and I'll be focusing on advancing the TWAIL approach um, in international refugee law. I wondered if you had any advice on how I can bring together sources that seem very disjointed and mainly reference the colonial origins, rather than referring to themselves um, under the TWAIL narrative. So yeah, once again, just a purely academic question. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before closing this round, I give the floor to <coughs> Dila Dat Pant. Dila, hello. Nice seeing you. Floor over to you. Hi, hi, Felix. Thank you so much. I have a very brief question. Thank you very much for this wonderful session. Uh, a very quick question to one of the panelists who very pertinently raised the question on right to development. My country, Nepal, nearly lost a 500 million US dollar grant recently, and the country was nearly uh, on the verge of uh, violence and the dust hasn't settled yet, although the parliament has passed um, or endorsed the grant. So I was just wondering what academia or the scholars would think about right to development when, when the international grant or the finance system is trying to promote such economic agenda in, in, the, in the third country or developing countries like Nepal. How would uh, the scholars view these anomalies between the political, uh, political viewpoints, uh, say capitalist versus socialist or say nationalist sentiments that come around the international aid system? Thank you. Thank you very much. And with this, I'm closing the round of uh, <coughs> questions, uh, interventions uh, to give a chance back to our speakers two minutes each for your, well, replying to all the questions you may want to reply to, even if it's a short time for that, and also for concluding remarks before then closing the meeting. And I suggest we just go maybe in the order that we had you speak in the very start. If Fabia, you would like to, to start, then uh, coming to Tamila's second speaker. So many questions out there. I will not uh, repeat them in the interest of time, but give the floor directly over to you, Fabia, please. Okay, many thanks, wonderful questions and all acute topics and stuff that, yeah, we need, we need to think about it. Um, so let me also be super honest about, I'm, I'm not a practitioner, so I think there are, uh, differently from my fellow panelists here who are doing their thing, putting their hands on and trying to, with their praxis, do stuff uh, in the world. I think my, my contribution here is, is has limits in terms of what can be achieved and what can be actually changed in the world. I must say that I'm not a super, um, despite, let me put it like this, despite agreeing with um, the Twail um, perspective on the possibilities of hey imagining the international, of hey hey imagining an international order, and this is always open to us. No, even if we are dealing with a structure of knowledge that has lots of limitations and issues and reproducing many and many things. I think, uh, Hayusha, your comments on, on your um, surroundings, no, and, and the way we, and also resonates with what Obi was saying um, before. No, we have, we have been having these experiences in many places and, Ho horrible situations in many places of, of the world. And now, of course, it's really complicated to watch certain um, manifestations, I don't know, from the US and so on and so forth about this, um, which is an aggression for sure, but still stuff has been happening in the world. 
So despite the possibility that whalers do acknowledge of engaging with international law from a productive and um, politically interesting way to reimagine, use international law to reimagine it politically our world, of course, I think we need to be aware of what we can achieve in terms of the vocabulary of rights and the vocabulary of um, um, rights to development. Despite I'm not, so this, this is important, I'm not an expert on the, um, on how to implement this thing. So I think it makes a huge, a huge difference. But um, somehow to whale offers us a very interesting standpoint to actually understand this um, machinery of international law. And as Obi has said so clearly, you know, um, foreground what is in the background and then try to open space for different political imaginations. So I'm not sure if, at least from my perspective of someone who studies international law in the academy with something that has lots of limitations, for me, it's not possible to just say, yes, we are going to change the world completely through international law, just through texts and I ideas. No, So it's very hard for me to kind of um, answer to all these questions and all the horrible things that we have been experiencing in many parts of the world and put all our faith in international law. I think we need struggle, we need political struggle inside law and outside law, especially. And I'm very, very proud to have colleagues and, and happy you know, to have um, see people that are actually putting their hands on and trying to change stuff. International law has limitations for sure it has, but it has also the possibility of political reimagination. So this is how I wanted to, to end my, my, my comments and without promising too much, but also maybe uh, thinking of international law as, as a possibility, as a horizon for different possibilities. Thank you very much, Fabia. Over to you, Tamil. Thanks very much. I mean, thanks very much to everybody who was asking questions there, Merva, Luisa, Ashish, um, and uh, Usha, obviously, uh, Fatima and Dila. Um, I, I, I think I will just uh, pick, pick uh, two um, questions uh, out of this in interest of time, because uh, most of the questions have a direct um, relationship to some of the content that was presented and also directly uh, directed at some people from the panel. So I will just perhaps look at, first of all, Merva's question slash comment, um, international human rights law as a yardstick for de decolonization, perhaps. I mean, um, if I just you know quickly quote uh, Professor Angie, um, Professor Angie said, uh, the international human rights law emerged as a central and revolutionary part of the United Nations period and offered one mechanism by which third world peoples could seek protection through international law from the depredations of the sometimes pathological third world state. Uh, and this is for this reason that international human rights law held a special interest and appeal for third world scholars. And indeed, uh, it was the right to self-determination that was the yardstick for us in order to fight for uh, the decolonization. But at the same time, we should be also clear, and this is, I think, a point that uh, Felix uh, triggered there earlier at the beginning, namely that third that international human rights law is now part and parcel of a neoliberal agenda that is now encroaching upon um, the sovereignty of the third world states. And there uh, we see uh, a close relationship of uh, money in the global north um, and the third world elite that is uh, actually uh, moving away from that uh, moment of the Bandung era and solidarity uh, where we were fighting for our emancipation. Um, so we have not only a fight to fight um, that flows from Fabio, what she said, um, uh, you know, uh, against uh, the most powerful elites in the North, but also I think it's, it's a, uh, a fight for the law, with the law, um, outside and inside, um, and uh, that goes also against the third world elite. Um, so I do and appreciate international human rights law as a potential tool, but we need to decolonize it and um, de-elitize it, uh, if you wish. And then um, I think uh, Luisa had a great question there on text justice. I think um, having lived and still lived somewhat in the Republic of Ireland, I think it's it's a it's an issue that is also related to the global north. Um, but uh, perhaps I would like to um, address quickly Fatima. Um, I think Fatima, for your research, 
Professor Chimney, um, our great book, Professor Chimney, is a man who has a refugee history like myself. And he has written also extensively on refugee, um, the, the role of the refugee from the international legal perspective on the colonial origins of uh, the refugee. So if you want to get in touch and I'm happy to uh, put you in contact with Professor Chimney in that regard. Um, but yeah, that would be it. Thanks Felix and I'm stopping now. Thank you very much. And I hope everybody can stay with us for two or three minutes more so we can also quickly hear from Shiami and from Obi uh, reactions to the question and con concluding remarks. So Shiami, over to you. Um, thank you. So to continue in that same spirit, just to make a couple of comments because we are running over time. Uh, indeed, it's um, it, it's not easy um, to 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 decolonize international law or human rights law. Uh, I mean, I can tell you from the experience of the right to development, it is not easy uh, because um, there, there is a lot of obstacles. There is uh, there is a lot of. Uh, the, I'm sorry. I'm sorry about that. Um, maybe, maybe I can come back after. Okay. Obi, Obi, over to you. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, just again, uh, there isn't uh, much time, but um, so I'll just uh, respond to a couple. Uh, I think Kusha's question. Um, uh, in terms of the potential to draw uh, norms from Global South traditions is, is an important one. I think there's been some, some uh, inflow, uh, she knows, uh, that is occurring uh, at the level of the Human Rights Council. The right to development, uh, of course, is one that has African, even Senegalese origins, to be more specific. Uh, but of course, uh, this is uh ebbed and flowed we've seen that this there's been a lot of debate uh, contention resistance and and all that but perhaps that's to be expected in the multicultural world where everybody doesn't start from the same uh pool of knowledge or understanding um so so but i think there's a, a lot of potential i've written about this myself for more of that i think we do not know enough yet as bakshi has taught us about even the, the, the aspects of those traditions that support the existing uh, International Bill of Rights, uh, let alone uh, those that problematize it or enrich it in other ways, right? So I think there's, 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 a, uh, there's potential uh, that is not uh, slightly unrealized, but there's some, some progress uh, that have been made. Um, in terms of, uh, the question, and perhaps this is uh, the last <laughs> point I would make. Uh, um, uh, uh, Bevert's uh, 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 point uh, is well taken. International human rights has liberatory potential. That is why some of us wake up in the morning. Uh, you know, uh, it does uh, uh, have put a liberty potential, including within third world states, and we have written about it. Most, most of my work is actually on that uh, um, in very practical ways. For example, the role that the Nigerian labor movement, Nigerian human rights activists have played. I have books on that. So, um, however, that does not in any way detract from. Uh, pointing out the pitfalls of the ways in which human rights are actually done, what I call the living human rights, when the tire hits the, the, the road or the dirt, as the Americans prefer to say, wow, how is human rights, the actual praxis, uh, and even the conceptualization, how does it actually uh, proceed and how can we uh, better uh, uh, legitimize it globally and, and then fully more fully actualize its potential. I'm so sorry that I didn't get to everyone's questions. I wanted to get the extraterritoriality, but again, that's a huge topic. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll just stop at this and apologize uh, to, to the rest. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, Obi. And sorry that we are running out of time, but indeed uh, there would be much more to say. So I think maybe also it's something to continue the discussion also then bilaterally, but Maybe Shami in the, the, the one minute to us to end and complete what you said. I don't know if you also wanted to address this ATO question. 
Thank you. Um, as we know, for, we have the Maastricht principles, the Lindbergh principles on extraterritorial obligations, particularly for economic, social, cultural rights. So something to look at, even though putting them into practice is something more difficult. Uh, of, of course, the right to development in, in its intrinsic framework um, includes extraterritorial obligations and collective obligations. And also for the right to development, we have the regional instruments, African Charter on Human Rights, uh, Human and People's Rights, the Arab Charter, the ASEAN Declaration on Human Rights, the Abu Dhabi Declaration, the, uh, the Ameri inter-American system has something close to the right to development, not quite the right to development, but close. So, um, just to say that there, Usha, also to answer your question, I think that the regions have spoken. The right to development is also included in all of the, let's say, the non-Western regions of the world, the third world, let's say. And we have to take all that into account. Justiciability has been very low. We have only a few cases, mostly in Africa and mostly on the national level. So where indigenous people have been thrown out of their lands for tourism, et cetera. But we need a lot more of the international. And I think there's almost a first, there's always a first time. There's always space. There's all, always scope. Also because there's a huge appetite for these issues now, like illicit financial flows, capital flight. We have the FACTI report and we have so many new developments within the UN, or I agree very much in a policy status, but at some point we have to put that policy into practice and we need good uh, lawyers in those countries which are affected, which can bring up these cases. Uh, I, I'll stop there, thank you. Well, thank you all very much. Thank you to the speakers for your excellent interventions, for the reactions to the questions. I think we really went from the geographical history of TWAIL to the global topical approach of the substantive future also what I see in, in that approach. And I think the academic questions some of you asked are very policy relevant. So, so it's great to have this, those discussions. And uh, <clears throat> I'm looking forward to, to more engagement, to more to come. And uh, would like in closing just to, to invite you to keep an eye on our project at the Geneva Academy on deconstructing and reconstructing universality subscribe also to our newsletter um, if you would like to be informed about more of such conversations coming up. And obviously also, as I said in the start, this uh, event is, is recorded and will be made available online for also those who due to other events were not able to join us right now. So again, a big thank you to all the panelists, to all those of you who participated and also to my former colleague, Emily Max, who very much helped in the conceptualization of this event. And with this, I would like to wish you all a very nice uh, weekend, <clears throat> despite the global situation that we're discussing. But again, as we said, global discussion, which in many places is not as we wish it would be for, but uh, that uh, this movement and also other work, other human rights work, hopefully in a preventive uh, aspect also can contribute to, it, to making it a better place. So thanks again to all of you. Thank you.